Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our next installment of the <coughs> study of the Gospel. Of <coughs> Excuse me, if I get my voice to work. The study of the Gospel of Matthew. <coughs> Welcome to those who are online and watching us as well. We're glad to have you join us. As we do, we will begin with a couple of our uh, young people to share their scripture with us. So uh, go. Good morning. I'm Abby, and I'm in eighth grade. First John 4:19 says. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever, whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. I like this verse because it reminds me to love others like God loves us. I see in this verse that if we just love others, most things will have a positive outcome. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for showing us your love. Help us to still love others even though it is hard to love them. Thank you for still loving us even though we still sin. In your precious son's name we pray, amen. amen. The first I chose is John 14, verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come for you. I chose this verse because it tells me that God won't leave me and will love me. I see in this verse that God loves us as his own and we will not be forsaken. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, I pray that you surround us with your love and grace. I pray that we are also aware of your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. I pray we can love each other even when they're hard to love. That's great. <laughs> that was very good. Thank you. All right. Um, announcements this morning. None? I have just a couple. First of all, a reminder that when you leave here and get out on North Avenue, you, you cannot turn left. Well, you can, but they don't like it. <laughs> don't turn left, go right, and go all the way down to the parkway, and, and then either go north or south from there. Or you can do a U-turn and come back if you want to come back through this mess, but I don't know why you'd want to do that. But um, So that's announcement one. Announcement number two is after this week, we have... Um, Two more weeks before Memorial Day, and we go to the last Thursday before Memorial Day. And before you ask me when do we start again, look on your calendar, find Labor Day, or the next Thursday after it. So the first Thursday after Labor Day is when we start again. So there you go. So when you see me this summer, you don't have to ask me. You already know. Um, all right, but so two more weeks after this. Uh, we will obviously not finish Matthew, so we will just kind of stop where we are, and then we'll pick it up again in the fall uh, in our continuing study of this gospel. Okay, uh, it is uh, the beginning of fishing season. Um, for those of you who like to fish, the potholes are ready, but you might need to get a pothole license. I don't know. Um, for <laughs> You never know when you might need that. Uh, this is, uh, I, I just couldn't resist this one. Bible scholars believe that on top of everything else, Job was also a Cub fan. So, <laughs> the Cub fans who may be here, I apologize, but that was too good to pass up. And then um, the Pew World, this is for us here. It's made of solid chestnut wood. It sleeps eight. <laughs> I've had those kind of pews in churches that I've served. <laughs> My first parish, I put a guy to sleep in five minutes every week. <laughs> okay, uh, enough of that. Let's uh, turn this on. <clears throat> and let's, let's begin. Good and gracious God, we are grateful for the manifold blessings you shower upon us. Today, as we uh, dive into your word again, we are grateful for this gospel, that, that your servant Matthew, who labored to write it down and who shared your message with us so that we too might be followers of Jesus. So bless our study this morning as Jesus enlists us in our missionary activity as well as his original 12. Bless our study in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, we are in chapter 10 
We're picking it up at verse 5. We spent last week on the first four verses as we kind of took a, a little more up close and personal look at each of the disciples uh, and who they were, where they came from, and uh, what happened to them afterwards to the extent that we know. Most of that is not written down anywhere, but most of that is covered by by uh, church tradition and uh, what happened to them. And so it's probably pretty accurate uh, what happened to them. So that was last week. Now Jesus gathers his 12 apostles, his 12 <coughs> followers, uh, and note, we noted last week that's the first time he uses that term, or Matthew does, uh, and it's a disti <coughs> distinctive term because it means sent ones. You cannot be a, an apostle and stay at home. <laughs> you are sent. That's what an apostle is. We are also his apostles. So he gathers them out to give them instructions. The section that covers the rest of chapter 10 uh, is what's known as the missionary discourse or the second discourse uh, or sermon, if you will, of Matthew. Matthew uh, of Jesus. Matthew records his gospel surrounding five sermons. We saw the first one, the Sermon on the Mount, which is the longest of the five. This is the second one, where Jesus pauses to give instruction, first of all to the twelve, but broader than that to his, the other followers, and then broader than that to the whole church that followed <coughs> after them. And so this second discourse is often called the missionary discourse because it is geared to being sent out. What are some of the things to be aware of as we go out to share the gospel? Some of it was applicable only to the 12. Much of it is applicable to us as well, even uh, 2,000 years later. There are three sections to this discourse. Um, and the first are verse five, 5 to 15. The first 10 verses are specific instructions to the 12 that apply to their situation. Um, the ones that they, the situation that they will encounter. The second section is similar, but it seems to be broader, more long range uh, for being a witness for Jesus after the resurrection. And the final section is not so much addressed to the 12, but to the crowd and also then to us. It fits all people who even now want to share the good news of Jesus in a hostile world. So that's the three parts of this um, discourse, this sermon uh, that Jesus proclaims to his disciples and to us. Let's read verses 5 through, um, well, let's just read 5 to 15. Let's read that section first. I need to give you the mic. Whoop. Here you go. Still on. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you pr go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, and cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that t home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Okay. Jesus, I want you to go back to uh, verse chapter 9, um, verse 38. 36, verse 36, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then go to verse 
5. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no towns of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's who Jesus' primary focus on is on right now. He sends them out uh, to the lost sheep. They're not to go to the Samaritans or to the Gentiles. Now, he's not excluding them, but that's, this is a priority list. The first priority is to go to the towns of Israel because the time is short. He wants them to get there before he does. It's their sort of a, an introduction to Jesus when they go to these various towns. Their message is the same as that of John the Baptist. Repent, and uh, the, for the kingdom of heaven is near. God is coming among them. He's coming among them specifically in the person of Jesus Christ. And the people need to be ready. He's coming with grace and forgiveness, but forgiveness is meaningless if there's no repentance. If you don't need a re someone to forgive you, then they don't, then they, they have no use to them. So the, their message was to get them ready for the reality that Jesus is coming with a message of grace and, and forgiveness. But if they don't need it, why come? So that's what their focus is, to those who are receptive to those who are ready to hear that message. Jesus authorizes them, gives them the authority to do what he's been doing, to preach, to heal, to raise the dead, to cleanse the leper, to cast out demons. Those are the things that Jesus has been doing, and now they're given the authority to do exactly the same thing. Um, they are given that unique role to bring God's plan of forgiveness and restoration to a broken world caught up in sin. So that's their, that's their task. But then he sends them out with some specific instructions, verses 9 and 10. He said, don't take any money with you. Don't make any plans for your own physical needs. Why not? Because the worker is worthy of his food. That's a quote from Deuteronomy. Uh, that's not a new idea. Uh, the prophets throughout the Old Testament were supported by people, and Jesus later on calls them prophets. So that's not a new concept, but it's a scary concept. To set out without any provisions is a little bit frightening, but that's where their faith comes in. Do they have faith in Jesus that he will make sure that they're provided for? If so, then go. Uh, but don't take anything along with them. They are to go to the homes. The homes that show themselves worthy, deserving, are the ones that welcome them, that respond to their message, that um, they will provide for them. They will happily provide for them, and they should stay with them. A home that is not worthy, that is not deserving, is, is the one where, that reject his message, that don't want to have anything to do with them. They're to just leave them alone. Um, the gift of peace with God cannot remain on such people. The apostles' peace rejected by the unbelievers will return to them. Um, and that ominous note of rejection will be one of the main themes in the next section of this discourse. Um, there will be rejection. But how people respond to the gospel, and this is true then and it's true up to today, and it will be true to the end of time. How people respond to the gospel determines their eternal fate. If you reject Christ, you are lost. There is only one way into salvation, and that's through Jesus. And if you do not use that door, if you shut that door, if you reject it, then you, you are out, you're out alone. So Israel. Israel it consists by and large of lost sheep. Uh, the creation reeks of death and brokenness. It's alienated from the <laughs> Creator God. The 12 missionaries are sent to announce that God is reversing all of that, that he's bringing life and healing to people. 
They are to raise the dead. They are to produce peace. But those who reject that peace will themselves be rejected. Uh, by when they are rejected, uh, they are to shake the dust off their feet when you leave that place as a gesture of um, rejection, uh, to dramatize that there is no connection anymore to the inhabitants of that home or that village. And they're not to d linger around there. They're not, if they're rejected, move on. Move on. Don't stop and try and argue your way in. If they reject it, they reject it. There's too many other places to go and too short a time. So be, be after it. Um, the time frame will be, will be given in a little bit, but right now you get the impression that this is urgent. They need to get going. Uh, and they may, need to go from village to village around Israel, not to Samaria, not to, not to the Gentiles yet. That'll come later. Questions? Yes. In uh, verse where it talks about uh, if they reject your message, we right. so just go on someplace else. Does that apply to us today? If we're, we're, we know someone is not a believer, and we're, right. we're bringing the message of salvation to them, and they don't listen, do we just forget about it then? Not forget about them, but understand that, well, but this is a different time, and right then the message was urgent because Jesus was going to follow them to these towns and he knew he had a limited amount of time. Okay. So the time was urgent then. But there is constantly that struggle of as we, um, as we do this personally or as we do this as a church, where do we, let's talk about as a church, where do we invest our resources? We're not going to invest our resources where it's producing no results. You know, that's, that's a waste of resources. On the other hand, as you have friends, neighbors, um, maybe family members who have continued rejected, that's maybe an ongoing project for you. You know, continue to pray for them, continue to uh, share with them. Whether or not they convert is not your issue. That's not up to you. That's up to God. But God desires all people to be saved. And so he will use us. And so maybe he puts you in that situation with that particular person to be the light to them in their darkness. They may not, re they may not take it. It doesn't mean that you stop talking to them. Uh, continue to be the witness you are to them. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm is, is it indicative that this is still God's chosen people in this kind of history? Yes. And does that equate to today also? Uh, in terms of the people of Israel? Yes. Uh, they, are, they are always God's chosen people, but there are consequences of rejecting Christ. Um, if you notice, how many disciples does Jesus choose? Twelve. What is he doing? He's reconstituting a new Israel. This is a new covenant. This is a new era. And uh, the first invitation goes to the original chosen people, but they reject it, and so they go to the Gentiles. Paul saw that as his reason to go to the Gentiles, because the Jews rejected him. Um, so uh, I know that there are those who say that some of the promises made to in the Old Testament to Israel still apply. I don't know if they do. Because you reject Christ, you reject all that God has to offer. Okay? Are they the chosen people? Yes, you can still use that title. Because they were. But we're the chosen people as well. We've been chosen by Christ to be part of his kingdom, his church. So, other comments? All right, let's, let's dive into part two of this missionary discourse, and that's 16 down to 25. Let's read that section. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. 
Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will, be per, will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. We're going to stop there. Okay. Rejection and judgment. Verse 16 is an interesting passage. Uh, be shrewd as, uh, shrewd as um, serpents, wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Now what in the world does that mean? Um, we often equate serpents as being wise. I'm not sure why, but that equation. But innocent as doves, I'm, you know, or... Um, exactly what that means. This section um, brings a darker theme than the first part, and that darker theme is that we can expect, or the disciples can expect, opposition and persecution uh, to the point of torture, maybe even physical death. Now that didn't happen to them in that immediate context of their immediate visit to the towns before Jesus got there, and this is before the, the arrest of Jesus. They weren't persecuted then, but it does apply broader and later on after the resurrection. Um, from the, the first three years of the story of, the first three centuries of the story of Christianity is, is a horrendous story, or a story of, of torture and persecution and death uh, in the most hideous forms, simply because they were followers of Jesus. Um, and so, this is a, a, a precursor, warning to all of that that's coming to all of those who call themselves followers of Jesus. And so Jesus uh, uses this double image to be as shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves. Combine wisdom in being smart about what you do and where you go and how you do it, but to use also the realization that you may be treated badly, and but to go into that innocently. Do not, do, do not earn the persecution. Do not do those things which cause offense, which cause opposition, but expect opposition. It will happen. The story of the Christian church down through the centuries is a story of opposition a story of rejection, a story of persecution, and it's going on even to today. People who are suffering, physical suffering, because they are followers of Jesus, it's still happening across our globe. Um, I always, it, it, it astounds me, I always found it absolutely amazing that a, a message of love and forgiveness and acceptance meets with such opposition. And Satan is just, he's going to do anything to stop it. And it's just, I find it fascinating, horrifying, the way people reject, reject the simple gospel message. Um, if you want to read uh, what I'm talking about, if you are, are, are a reader and like to read history, pick up the book by Eusebius on the first three centuries of Christianity. Eusebius was a, uh, a writer, historian in, in the... Uh, first few hundred years of Christianity and wrote about what happened. Uh, it, ooh. It's a tough read. You've read it, Gary. You agree? That's a tough read. Yeah. So um, it, it's interesting if you want to know what happened to Christianity. Uh, but what, while the church was being persecuted in that first 300 years, it grew by leaps and bounds so that by the end of the year, first century, there were Christians in in England, as far east as, as far west as England and as far east as India, uh, Christians were everywhere, in spite of the opposition, in spite of the persecution. 
Um, so uh, the church grew rapidly during that time. Okay, so verses 17 and 18. Um, there, there's, it seems to indicate a mission activity beyond the immediate situation. It says they will be rejected and brought to trial before the Sanhedrin, but also in front of rulers and kings. The Sanhedrin will be, of course, the, the, the Jewish community will reject them, and, and they're brought to trial. Read the book of Acts. That's exactly what happened. They were brought to trial before the Sanhedrin um, within um, just a, a brief time after Jesus ascended. Rulers and kings would refer to Gentiles. Uh, that they would be uh, arrested and put on trial. And they were. Even uh, the first couple of martyrs, one was by the hand of the Jews, that's Stephen. James was uh, executed by Herod, so the rulers and kings are opposed to them. Um, so it's not agreed upon by interpreters whether this section uh, is just about their mission activity in Israel or rather about later mission ac activity uh, beyond Israel. And to that question, my answer is always the same. Yes, <laughs> it's both. They're going to expect opposition. They should expect opposition, but it's going to go beyond that immediate situation. But they go with a promise. Verses 19 and 20. They go with a promise. Um, you, it is not you who speak um, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Uh, the Lord will provide them with what they need to say when the time comes to say it. Don't worry about what you're going to say when you face opposition. You will have the words. You will have the right thing to say. I know that that's true. I've experienced that as I've tried to share something with someone else and I'm not sure what to say. And all of a sudden, words come out of my mouth, and I kind of look and wow, that was pretty good. Where'd that come from? <laughs> and it happens. God uses you, sometimes in ways beyond your understanding, to share the right message at the right time. Does it always happen? I don't know. God uses the, gives me the right words. Um, and so that's part of the blessing that God, the promise that God sends, Jesus sends these disciples with. Um, they will have what they need. Uh, the spirit who came to Christ in baptism is also going to come to them and will bless them as they proclaim the good news. Um, verses 21 and 22, the simple fact remains uh, that the call to faith in Jesus is not always peace, peaceful. It brings division. The fact that one believes and another does not can create conflict. Jesus' warning here is a simple statement of fact in these two verses, 21 and 22. Importantly, though, trouble will come to the apostles um, is as sure as is their faith in Jesus. The one who finally endures to the end, however, will be saved. I have experienced it. Maybe you have as well. Maybe you experience even in now in maybe families, uh, in your families, where one person believes and another doesn't. It creates a divide. It causes conflict. Because there is this something, and it's, it, you can disagree about the weather. You can disagree about the Cubs versus the Brewers. You can disagree about uh, Republican versus Democrat. You, that's all surface stuff, but when you start disagreeing about what you believe, that's fundamental. That's to the core of your being. And that's where conflict comes. There's a reason why wars are primarily religious wars, or at least they were down through the centuries, because that's the core of us. You're attacking what I, who I am. You know, say, we can disagree on on this baseball team or that football team or whatever. But when we get at the core of who I am, then we have a problem. If you reject that, then you reject me. And so that's what Jesus is talking about. Brother will deliver bro brother to death, father his child, children rise against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by all, by all for my name's sake. All of that happened in the early church 
And it still happens today, where one family member will turn another family member into authorities where it's against the law to be a Christian. It still happens today. And it's tragic, but it's real. That's the, that's the truth of it. And so their, their time is short. Um, verses 23 and 20, uh, verse 23, when they persecute in one town, flee to the next. For I truly say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. That seems to be directly to their situation. They are to get about the task. If they face rejection, don't stay there. Go on to the next. Go to as many as you can before I come. The reference to when the Son of Man comes will be his physical visiting those towns uh, as he goes around Ju uh, Galilee uh, and Judea. So uh, that seems to be very time sensitive there for that passage. Um, when Jesus is arrested, then, then their opposition, that, then the whole thing changes. But right now they are to go about the task. All right. That's the middle section. How are we doing? Maybe I'm going too fast. I do that sometimes. My wife will look at me and go, slow down. <laughs> yes? If somebody wants to read a little more modern uh, example of uh, rejection of Christ and what yeah. involves, is Reverend Richard Wormbrandt. Yes. Uh, from, I think it was Romania. Right. And uh, he was a pastor, a Lutheran pastor there. And on his way to church, he was arrested and spent, uh, I don't remember, is it 14 years? In right. Prison. And the way he was treated, and he came out. Uh, I heard him preach one time back in the 60s, and he yeah. showed his back with all the beatings that he had had. Right. The scar tissue that was there, all just because he wanted Do you remember his, his book? Yes. The name of it? Not right off the top of No, I, I can see it. I, I know who you mean. I met him as well um, back when I was uh, vicaring in Chicago in the, in the uh, late 60s. And I met him then. Um, but um, yeah, he was faced tremendous opposition. And it, 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 it's still today. It's still today, opposition. Uh, you guys know that firsthand too, don't you? You know, the Paley's experienced that firsthand through their son. Um, there's opposition uh, to the gospel. Um, even, even today in um, places like, like China and so forth, where Christians have to gather in small groups. They can't gather in large groups because that causes too much tension and, and opposition. So they gather in small groups. And yet the church there it grows by leaps and bounds. Um, in, in, um, in North Africa, in, in, well, throughout Africa, the um, conflict between Christians and Muslims is huge, and it's, that's a lot of what's behind what's going on in Sudan. Um, but, North um, Korea. Hmm? North Korea. North Korea as well. So uh, it, the church is probably growing fastest in places like North Africa, Africa uh, and others. Uh, it, it's growing incredibly fast. Um, we have... Uh, the, the, the word is working, and even though there is opposition, the word is working. Okay? Let's read verses 24 and 25, just those two verses. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? Okay, interesting that, that the NIV translates that word uh, student rather than disciple. It's the word for disciple, and disciple is a, a stronger word than a student. Um, I was a student when I went to class, and I sat in some teacher's classroom for 45 minutes and left. So I was his student, but I certainly wasn't his disciple. A uh, disciple is much more of an intense thing. It's a, it's a uh, you you are you commit your life to this to this rabbi to this teacher, and you follow him literally walk in his footsteps is what the word uh, the root meaning of the word. And so it's when when if you if you are following your teacher your rabbi you are his disciple, 
then you can expect to have happened to you what happens to him. Christians should not be surprised at opposition because what happened to our master, to our teacher, to our Lord? Yeah. He was crucified. Tremendous opposition. So we should not expect to be treated any differently. Um, we, um, we are his uh, disciples. We follow where he goes. Um, it is enough for the disciple, verse 25, uh, to be like the teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of his house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Now that reference misses us because we don't use that term anymore. Beelzebul, um, this is, um, if, if that's, if they call it Be yeah, Beelzebul, um, that's, a, that's a, an interesting term. Let me give a, see if I got it straight. I'm going to look at my notes here. Um, Jesus was called often Beelzebub. Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. It's a reference to Beelzebul, which is, or a mockery of that, which is the word Prince of Demons, and that's what Jesus uses here. He says, if they call you Beelzebul, um, it's another name for Satan. Jesus was often called an agent of Satan. And so he says, if they call me an agent of Satan, they're going to call you the same. Expect it. It's just the way it is. Um, so uh, Beelzebul is the word that he uses. Um, but... Um, Beelzebub is, is, a, is another derivation of it. And I may have this backwards. Let me look at, let me look at your Bible here for a minute. Yeah, I, no worries. I want to look at the notes. You don't have the notes on there. Yeah, it's, it's down here. Oh, down there it is. Okay, yeah, Beelzebul, okay. Yeah, okay. All right. So, all Jesus is saying is, don't be surprised when this stuff happens to you because it happens to me. And, and that became more and more apparent as, as the opposition to Jesus continued to grow. But again, these words are addressed not just to the 12, but to the church at large uh, and for, for all time. Uh, Jesus was, was a, had treated um, with hatred. We should, be, we should expect the same. All right, let's read 26 to 31. Do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Um, read just read verse 32 and 33 as well. Whatever acknowledges me, bef whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me for, before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Okay. This next section uses the words have no fear or do not fear three times. Um, they should not be afraid. Uh, notice he does not promise them that they should not fear because they will have no problems that all difficulty will be taken away from them, that they'll be protected from suffering. Quite the contrary. They will suffer, even those who are most faithful will suffer the most. But rather he invites them to see their opposition always in the light of eternity. What we face here is brief and temporary. What we have eternally cannot be taken away from us. So in the first place, Verse 26, the disciples do not fear because their opponents uh, can, you can uh, reveal your secret plans to them. This is an interesting passage. 
Uh, nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Um, my notes say, uh, and I'll just read you what my notes say, and even after I re wrote this down, I, uh, okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> they don't have to fear their opponents because the day will come on every secret of God's plans in Christ and on all of men's hidden sins and rebellion will be made known to all. While the disciples may be rejected and abused, hidden things are at work. On the last day, truth will come out and all the secret things will become known. Um, there you go. You can figure that out. <laughs> there are hidden things that are going on all the time. We're not ever told the true story in the opposition to the church. People are, are treating the church with, oh, with, oh yeah, that's fine, but... But all of that will be revealed. And so Jesus is simply saying, keep your focus on eternity, not on the immediate. Whatever's going on now is temporary. It won't last. Keep your focus on the end. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. The teachings that Jesus gives them now, one-on-one, -on -one, they can proclaim wide, widely later. I had the discussion with a group this morning. Uh, as Jesus did his miracles, he would tell the people he had healed, don't say anything to anybody. Keep it hidden. And we go, why did he do that? Well, there was a reason for him to do that. But then take that to the end of the Gospel of Matthew where he gives us the Great Commission where he says, go tell everybody. Well, there's a shift that happens. And what happens between one and the other is the cross. Before the cross, Jesus wants to control what's being said about him. But after the cross and after the resurrection, then the message is boldly proclaimed everywhere. And that may be behind what he's saying here. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered to you now, proclaim boldly after the resurrection. Then it can be simply uh, proclaimed publicly everywhere. Verse 28 is the second, do not fear. Don't fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And you've got to read that verse a couple of times. Because when I've read that before, I said, okay, don't be afraid of those who can kill me physically, but be afraid of Satan. Did you read that? It's not Satan. Be afraid of God. God is the one who has control over heaven and hell. Satan doesn't. If you reject God, he will reject you. That's what's behind that passage. Um, if you um, do not fear those who kill the body, don't worry about those who can kill you physically. Rather, be far more uh, concerned about God being, being in relationship to God. He can destroy both soul and body in hell. Satan can't do that. God can. So Jesus, it's far better to be rejected and killed by mortal enemies than it is to become the eternal enemy of God because of unbelief and rejection. Don't reject God. You can reject others. So when it comes crunch that time, do I share my faith or do I not? And we, we talk about that in just a couple of verses. When I share my faith or don't, which do you think is the better for me? I'm going to share my faith now and face opposition, but I know that God is there with me. If I reject my faith and don't share him, then I, return, I turn my back on God. Let's, let's look at a, a couple more verses. Um, and and uh, he says, uh, verse 31, Fear not, therefore, for you have more value uh, than, than any sparrows. Um, he says, uh, no, I'm sorry, that's, you have more value than any sparrows. Anyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me, before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. That's a huge word. And we don't catch the connection. That word, the Greek word for deny, is used twice in Matthew's Gospel. Here, and again in reference to Peter when he denied Jesus. 
That's what we're talking about. That kind of denial. Not just the denial, oh, should I go to church or not Sunday morning? That's not the denial we're talking about. We're talking about absolute rejection. I don't know the man. Whoever denies me before men. Of Peter, it says, he denied Jesus before them all. Same phrase. So it's far better to be rejected by mortal enemies than to be rejected by God. You deny God, you reject God, God will reject you. But it's not here, but you can add the provision. What happened to Peter when he rejected God? What did Jesus do for him? He forgave him. Specifically forgave him. So for us too. When we fail to be the witness that we should be. When we, by our lives and by our actions, deny Christ. Forgiveness is ours as well. And we can always fall back on the assurance that we are forgiven. The only eternal rejection of God, the only rejection of God that will result in eternal damnation is if it is never forgiven. If we never go back to Jesus and say, I'm sorry. That's something to be concerned about. But um, we do not need to fear because God is not going to reject us. And so the third, that's the third not be afraid, is it refers to uh, sparrows. Are you not uh, more value than many sparrows? <laughs> A sparrow, uh, someone calculated, um, sparrows could be purchased for one sixteenth of a denarius. Well, a denarius was a day's labor, so a cost of a sparrow was about a half hour's of work. Well, you're a little bit more valuable than that. This is what's called an argument from the lesser to the greater, and Jesus does it often. If this little sparrow is valuable to God, how much more valuable do you think you are? Because you're a lot more valuable than a, than a little sparrow. Not that sparrows are not valuable to God. They are. He tricks, he tracks them. He knows when they fall. But uh, you're a lot more valuable to God. He knows how many, how many uh, hairs on your head are there. They're all numbered. Some of us, that's easier than others. But um, <laughs> nothing personal. <laughs> Sorry, Dale. <laughs> But, so, do not be afraid. 29 to 31, uh, do not be afraid in face of the opposition because we are more valuable uh, than even sparrows. And then um, 32 and 33, confess Jesus boldly. Every, and this is, and this is for, for all people, for all followers of Jesus forever. We should use every opportunity to publicly confess Christ. And we should see that opportunity with eternal significance. Paul makes the comment in Corinthians where he, he uh, planted, Apollos watered, Christ gives the growth. As we share our faith, however simple that might be, to someone else. We don't know where they are in their walk of faith. Where they are just beginning to learn, or they have heard it many times and are not quite convinced, or where they are. We may be a part of that. We don't know. But we have the opportunity. When you have the opportunity to share faith, uh, my friend Ibu will say it doesn't take any effort to walk up to someone or to greet someone or to see someone and say, remember Jesus loves you. Um, and he said, you'll really cause them to, to ponder after that. Uh, it's all you need to do. He said, it's not more complicated than that. Just tell them, remember, Jesus loves you. Um, and, and I had a little conversation with, with a man yesterday as we were going into uh, to Lowe's. And he was getting in his car and he talked about being, you know, tough day and so forth. And I said, yeah, every day's a gift. And he said, yeah, it is. You know, 
that that's the kind of thing you can do that you can do it very simply it isn't it doesn't involve a lot of theology it's just simply sharing that you have a hope in Jesus so confess Jesus boldly uh, on the other hand to deny Jesus is to uh, turn your back on him uh, and we pray every day Lord forgive me for the times that I failed to be the witness that you've asked me to be. Okay, let's do one more quick section here, uh, verses 34 through 39. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. There, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Okay. Um, again, he repeats what he said earlier. Faith in Jesus can cause division in a family. He says, don't think I have come to bring peace on earth. I have come to bring peace, not peace, but a sword. One of the messianic beliefs was that that the, the Messiah would enter, into a, enter in a reign of peace. And he will, but we're not there yet. We're still in warfare mode right now. And the warfare mode is that we fight against the Satan, the opposition that's, that's mounted against the church. Um, and so before there can be a time of peace, there is a time of warfare. Um, when he says he has not come to bring peace, but a sword is referring to himself as the Messiah, the son of Joseph. He will bring the peace of the son of David, but right now, He's facing opposition. And his sword is not a military sword, but the sword of his word that divides families. My mouth is like a sharp sword, Revelation says. Uh, out of my mouth comes a sharp sword, uh, a double-edged sword. The word of God divides whether you agree with it or not. Ultimately, ultimately, every person who is confronted with the story of Christ has to decide, do I believe him or not? We'll talk about that more when he confronts Peter with that question. But everybody faces that at some point. And so the Messiah pits one against the other. Faith in Jesus sometimes involves ostracism and rejection by families or by communities. And he quotes Micah 7, <coughs> verse 6 um, in, in his uh, things. Um, whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Um, and then verse 36, um, he says, take up your cross and follow me. Now that, that passage has been really misused and misunderstood a lot. When you hear Jesus say, pick up your cross and follow me, do you picture yourself picking up a cross of crucifixion and that you're going to suffer? That's most interpreters will say that. That's not really what it means. The word that in, in Greek that is translated staros, that's translated cross, can also mean and does mean staff or rod. It's this, and when you go to the Septuagint, that's the Greek word that it uses for the Hebrew for like Moses' staff. So think Moses' staff more than you think the cross. Why? Because he, Jesus can't refer to the cross. It hasn't happened yet. They wouldn't know what he's talking about. But they would understand staff. And so you, this is a challenge for living, not for dying. This is a challenge to be on the task of following Jesus. Tick, pick up your staff and let's go. That's a walking stick, not a dying stick. That's what the word means to pick up your cross, to pick up your staff and follow Jesus. That's really what's being referred to here. Um, take up your cross, your staff, means to prepare to do the work of God. When Jesus sends out his disciples, he tells them to take up their staff. 
It's not so much as being willing to die for Jesus as it is to be willing to live for him, to be on the task, to be on the march. So if you have your own Bible, circle that word that's in that verse, and um, verse 38, and write in staff, because that's what the word means in the original Greek. All right, let's just finish this chapter, verse 40, 40 and 1 and 42. Just let's read this real quick. He who receives you will receive me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Okay. Jesus ends this missionary discourse with the assurance that they're not going out alone. Um, whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Remember that authority thing? As Jesus was given authority by God and he gives that to the disciples, well, it goes the other way. You receive a disciple, you're receiving the one who sent him, who, who is the one who was sent by God. Uh, and so um, they are going with Christ himself. They are, I should understand that wherever they go, Jesus is going. When they are re welcomed, Jesus is being welcomed. Um, later missionaries, uh, they're called prophets. Well, a prophet is someone who proclaims the word of the Lord. Do not think of prophet as a fortune teller. That's not the job of a prophet. The job of a prophet was to teach the word of God, to be a forth teller. So they are prophets. They are prophets who proclaim the word of God. And this goes back to the beginning of the discourse when he sends them out. They are to be treated as prophets. They are not to take anything along that people will support you. Well, that's what happened with prophets. And they're going to be seen as prophets. And they are righteous prophets. Why? Because Christ gives them his righteousness. Uh, he is the one who uh, is, a, he is a righteous person. And they can convey that righteous reward on to others. And even, he goes, even, even someone who brings a cup of cold water uh, is showing that they have faith, that they see and understand who you are and, are the and receive the benefit of that faith. Um, many years ago, I, I was doing a witness workshop, uh, and um, a, a woman came to me afterwards, and she said, she said two things. First of all, she said, I realized that I was witnessing already, because I said witnessing is simply sharing your faith, and we talked about that. And she said, there have been a work crew in the alley behind me, and I've been going out and bringing them bottles of Coke. Is that okay? <laughs> exactly. That's it. That's what this is about. By bringing that little cup of cold water, you're demonstrating that faith that you have. Um, and so uh, through all this, this whole section, I, and I covered this chapter a little bit quicker, but uh, the, the basic message is that God is with us. We're going to face difficulty. We're going to face struggle. Not everybody is going to be really happy that you're a believer in Jesus. Maybe you've experienced that in your family or in your friends. Some people are going to find it, that ridiculous. They're going to reject you. So fine. that's okay. God's with you. And he will not leave you alone. And he will go with you. And because of Jesus, we have a place in heaven where we will not face opposition anymore. Keep your eyes focused on that as we live out our faith from day to day. That's it. Take that home with you, okay? Package that up and take that home. Let's close the prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you that you are with us each and every day, that you grant us your presence, your blessing, your help, as we seek to witness to the faith that you've given us. Forgive us when we fail. Forgive us when we are not the bold witnesses that you called us to be. Uh, but use us, O oh Lord. Use us in ways that we do not even imagine. Get, prepare the hearts of people ahead of us so that when we touch them with your love, uh, they will be receptive. Grant your blessing upon us each day as we serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, reminder, when you leave the building, turn right. <laughs>